everyone in this room already lives in a wireless world. Um, the um, area that I'd like to talk about is how some of that wireless connectivity gets taken to the next level. And what that often gets called is called the leapfrog. And is it possible to take some of the new technology that's been developed in the, very, in the most developed countries in the world, bring that to less developed countries and actually permit people in those countries to get advances in technology much, much more quickly than they would if it would, had just been left to the natural inclination of things. And the two areas that I'd like to talk about today are internet speed. So how fast is your internet traffic? Because I think most places in the world, with the advent of satellite communications and whatever, you can get internet. But I want to talk specifically about internet speed and how fast it's operating. Um, and then the second area, which is a little bit further out, and Claire mentioned that as well, is in the area of potentially taking power and getting that to go wirelessly as well. So those are the two areas that I'd like to talk about. So it's what's going on in the industry, um, how would a leapfrog in, e in both these areas might work, what are the implications for governments, if any, um, and I'll, I'll try to keep that from a technology perspective, not a political perspective, even though I know that a lot of the people here are from government act, uh, various governments and uh, various forms of government activity. If you're interested in sort of learning about this, sort of, you know, after the talk or just at some point in the not too distant future, there are two really, really good studies that are out there that um, are well worth taking the time to read. The first is actually from the World Bank, and I know the head of the World Bank is speaking here at the conference as well, but there's one from the World Bank that talks about what does internet access look like for everyone around the world. And one of the interesting comments about it, for all the billions of people that are in the world, how many people have what's called high-speed internet access? And it's actually a surprising number of people yet in the world actually don't have high speed. And, um, and the disadvantage of that is, how do people that don't have advantage of the things that everyone in this room is able to take advantage of participate in a digital economy? The, the second study um, is actually from the International Telecommunications Union, which is a Swiss-based organization that talks about the internet and how that um, is available um, across the world and what percentage of the people actually have uh, those capabilities. And what does that mean practically? Practically, it's in two areas, and this is a little bit of an eye chart for, even for you to look at, but let me see if I can explain it. On the left-hand side, that's price, and on the right-hand side, it's performance. And what you'll see is that in less developed countries around the world, the price of internet access is extremely high compared to the developed world. And the, uh, along with that, on the right-hand side, the performance of the internet is exactly inverse. So the less developed countries have the worst internet performance in terms of speeds, and if you look up there, it's actually the gray areas, and a lot of it exists in African countries, but it's well below 256 kilobits a second. And interestingly enough, what's the, the, the uh, best country in the world for internet access is actually Korea, has the highest speed in, um, in the entire world. Um, you know, I'm from the US, we tend to think of, that we have sort of the best of everything. Actually, the U.S. is probably sixth or seventh down the list, somewhere in the, it's, it's pretty far down the list in terms of actually performance. But when you look at it from a developing country standpoint, high prices and lousy performance are areas where there's huge opportunities for improvement. Um, there's an interesting analogy between electrification, which occurred between um, the late 1800s and the 1940s, and if you actually took and plotted 
electrification and how it grew. And then what you did is just took the date and skewed it a little bit and put it in for internet. And that's, you know, it's basically information and communication technology, ICT. It's remarkable how similar the adoption curves look for this. And so that's actually potentially a really big opportunity to create a leapfrog. So internet speed, as uh, Claire mentioned, I, I come from a company uh, based out of Boston called Speedy Packets. Um, it was developed actually at, by a professor at Caltech, she got her PhD at MIT, figured out that the way internet works, um, and I'm not sure how many people actually think about this, but the internet works by packets of technology. And the packets of information get lost, and that usually is where you end up having performance problems. And so um, what she discovered was that if you coded the internet differently from where the source of the internet traffic came from to its destination, so think of what you're requesting for information to your cell phone or vice versa, where you're going from a computer and you're uploading information, if you could improve that through software, um, the potential for improvement is there. So in the developed world, um, the, um, I'll, I'll use an example here. So may, some of you may be familiar with Apple TV. So what you're looking at on the screen are basically a typical evening environment where you'll see it says 5% packet loss and 100 milliseconds of delay. That's typical in the US. If you look at it on the left-hand side, that's what you would see with that spinning, so we call it the spinning circle of death. On the right-hand side is with the Speedy Packets technology. And look at the difference in the performance. And you can actually look up there and you'll see the bit rate, how fast it's running, with regular internet and with it sped up. And actually, if you do the math, that internet traffic is running 20 times faster, and that's typical performance that you would see in the US during an evening period of time. So imagine getting a 20, per 20 times performance improvement under what are typical congestion problems. Um, the internet, many of you think, is actually two-way, right? So that's coming down, what about going up, where you're taking information and sending it back up to the internet? So I'd like to show you another example as well. Um, if I were to use two iPads, so you're looking at two iPads side by side, same conditions, congested internet in the evening, 5% packet loss, 100 millisecond delay, and what we'll do is select a photo sharing app, it's called Shutterfly, and upload the same photos at the same time and see what the difference in performance is merely by changing the software environment. So what we'll do is select five random photos on each one of the iPads. So remember, on the right-hand side, it's speedy packets. Hit the Upload button. And then watch what happens in terms of how much quicker it goes. So the little spinning disk will tell you. And you'll see one, two, three, four. Um, all five of them are completed. None of the five have even gotten partially through it yet. So that's um, interesting to think about when you think about developing countries because almost all internet access is wireless. It would be cost prohibitive to put in wired access. And satellites, which are actually a very reasonable way to do it, I showed you at 100 milliseconds, that's one-tenth of a second, a satellite transmission up and back to a geostationary orbit where the satellite moves with the Earth is 600 milliseconds. So imagine if that was your internet technology that you had, how on Earth would you be able to do that? And so utilizing this technology is potentially quite powerful in the, the um, less developed countries because you could use the same exact infrastructure but just adding software into the internet. And I wanted to just show you. This is an example. This is a $5 part that I purchased. It's basically a small Wi-Fi computer. You can buy it pretty much anywhere. 
Um, if you loaded the Speedy Packet software, what I just showed you here locally as Wi-Fi, all of you could access this in this room and be seeing those kind of performance improvements across the internet. So wouldn't it be cool if that actually could happen worldwide in terms of performance? So that's a little bit on internet speed. I wanted to talk about sort of things that are a little further out there. Wireless power. I spent six years at another university spin-out called Witricity. What you'll see, by the way, on the left-hand side, it shows what electricity usage looks like worldwide. And not surprisingly, less developed countries have less electric infrastructure because it's incredibly expensive to put it in. And on the right-hand side was an experiment done at MIT in 2007. What you're looking at is the team of physicists that discovered this phenomenon. You'll see that there's a coil on the left, looks like refrigerator tubing. It actually is refrigerator tubing. And on the right is a 60-watt light bulb being lit from that at a distance of about two meters. So that technology is actually a little bit more modern, and it's not the kind of thing you're going to see immediately, but I thought I would show it to you for those of you that haven't had an opportunity to actually see it firsthand. And I'll show you a small uh, demonstration of it now. So just like that picture with the scientists there at MIT, here is a coil with some electronics in it. It's a coil of wire. And here's another one that is at a distance. And check this out. I mean, I'm, I'm probably half a meter away. By the way, it works next to it. Would work through me. It's completely safe, by the way. It's a magnetic field. And you can put it through. I'm guessing it probably would work through objects as well. So imagine if you could do things with this. And there's a lot of applications for this. The one I wanted to talk about, which I think has some imp interesting implications for, the, for less um, developed countries, would be to put it in roadways. And I want to show you a product that actually BMW is going to bring out. I'm going to run a video. BMW is the first car manufacturer providing wireless charging for your BMW 5 Series iPerformance. It's the comfortable way to charge your BMW plug-in hybrid. Blue lines in the center display guide you to position your BMW above the ground pad. As soon as a green circle appears, you are directly over the charging plate. When you switch off the ignition, the charging starts automatically. And this is how it works. The primary coil in the wireless charging station generates an electromagnetic field. The secondary coil in the car then transfers the energy to the high voltage battery pack. A completely empty battery is fully reloaded within three and a half hours. BMW wireless charging makes charging easier than refueling. So that's, that's what BMW is doing in the developing world. This is available, actually, I think you can order it now, it uses that Witricity technology. Um, Imagine if you could use this elsewhere. So in Korea, they put it into buses. And they put it into the road. And here's a little clip that I found from the Wall Street Journal on using the same technology at very high power levels in Korea. This is not your regular bus. In South Korea, commuters are riding the world's first electric buses that can charge wirelessly on the move. The bus gets power from the supply pad under the road, which recharges it as it drives, a technology that could revolutionize mass transit. Called Olive, these buses have significantly high power transfer through the air, and engineers predict that this kind of power can match the speed of high-speed railways. Yoon Woo Yeol, one of the engineers who worked on this bus, says the buses are safe for two. So in rainy day, driver or user can experience an electric shock in case of wireless charging people would not experience never this kind of electric shock. So this is the main advantage. 
Even with this green technology, bus driver Kim hong up sees little difference between the normal buses he's been driving for the past 16 years and the new olive ones. It's got power. It's quiet. It doesn't smell. I'm satisfied. But as a test driver, Kim keeps a close watch over battery power, making sure it doesn't fall below 30%. Experts say infrastructure costs make it difficult for this technology to be adopted worldwide, but they agree this is a step in the right direction for electric vehicles. Powerhouses like Qualcomm and Bombardier are also testing a similar technology. For The Wall Street Journal, I'm Jayab Kwok. So I went and visited the test site of that because it uses the technology that I just showed you here, just on a much higher power level. The power level that was being demonstrated in that was 200 kilowatts of energy. They put, installed it on a 24-kilometer bus route. So if you think about that, 24 kilometers, those coils that they put in the road took up only 300 meters. So if you just think about the math, they were able to electrify a roadway with 300 meters for 24 kilometers. The potential of that for leapfrogging as more and more vehicles go electrified is really quite, um, uh, it's a huge opportunity. It's a few years out. It's not as sort of here and now as speeding up our internet traffic in the wireless world, but it certainly is one of those areas. From a governmental standpoint, thinking about it, in terms of internet speed up technology, that's primarily one of regulation and you know, I mentioned earlier about not being political about it, but the whole concept of net neutrality and that internet speeds are sort of available for everyone at the same speed. Um, this speed up technology really, from a governmental perspective, could be deployed today as long as it's permitted to do so. And that has implications from everyone from governments to cell phone carriers to telecom regulations, all of that sort of thing. The second um, area for wireless power and putting that in is primarily one of an infrastructure investment, which is where governments do have to get involved. And the commentator for the uh, Wall Street Journal made the comment that it was cost prohibitive today, and it probably is. But when you consider the basic math of that for a very modest infrastructure investment, the type of performance improvements that you could get are the kind of area where I think there's a huge opportunity for both of them. So we're all living in the wireless world. It would be nice if we could bring that to the rest of the world as well. Thank you very much.